Welcome back, Statistics Scholars. Today we're going to continue our discussion of ANOVA. And the first thing I'm going to do is run you through another example of ANOVA from start to finish and how we would then put all of the numbers on the source table. But then also we're going to learn how to look up the critical value in table A3 in the back of your book and then what conclusions we can then draw based on that overall omnibus ANOVA where we calculate the overall one-way F statistic. Right, and then we're going to learn about follow-up tests. All right, so here is an example of, of ANOVA, right? So we have uh, a new drug and Zoloft and a placebo group, where the numbers here are people's individual scores on depression. So higher numbers would mean more depression, right? And so we've got person number one got a depression score of one, person two got a depression score of two, person three got a depression score of six, right? So our first group is a new drug with depression scores. And then you've got a second group who took Zoloft, which is another drug for depression. And then the third group took a placebo. And our question then is, are these groups the same or different? Right, the null hypothesis would say that in the population, the depression scores of people who take these three different drugs are not different. That these, on average, people would be exactly the same, that it makes not a bit of difference what drug you take. The null hypothesis would say that the drug that you take, that ca categorical qualitative variable, does not factor in, right? Where the alternative says it does factor in, at least two of these groups are different from each other, right? Could be new drug compared to Zoloft, could be Zoloft compared to placebo, could be new drug to placebo, but the alternative says at least one pair is going to have a statistically significant mean difference, right? So let's walk through it. The first thing I'm going to do is get my sums of squares between, where the first thing I'm going to have to do is get the x bar for each of my groups, right? I'm going to have to get the x bar for each of my groups. So I've got my first group, the new drug group. So and to get the sums of squares between, I'm going to look between the groups. I'm going to take, and so the first thing I'm going to do is get a subgroup average for each one of my groups, where I compare the subgroup average to the grand mean. Because let's refresh our memory on the equation for the sums of squares between. You take each subgroup average minus the grand mean. You're going to square those, sum those, and then multiply that by baby n. That is how to get the sum sub squares between. And so the first thing I've done for the first group, I get 1 plus 2 plus 6 plus 3 is 12. 12 divided by 4, because that's how many people there were in the group, is 3. So the average amount of depression for my first group is 3. Then I get my Zoloft group. 4 plus 6 plus 8 plus 6 is 24. 24 divided by 4 is 6. So the average amount of depression for my second group is 6. Then I take the placebo group. 7 plus 8 plus 9 plus 8 is 24. 24 divided by 4 is 8. So my average for the third group is 8. So x bar sub 1 is 3. x bar sub 2 is 6. And x bar sub 3, I'll write them over here, hold on. I'm going to write them over here. x bar sub 1 is 3, x bar sub 2 is 6, and x bar sub 3 is 8. Right? So I've got my three x bars. But now I'm going to need to get, need to get a grand mean. So to get the grand mean, I just add all the numbers together. 1 plus 2 plus 6 plus 3 plus 4 plus 6 plus 8 plus 6 plus 7 plus 8 plus 9 plus 8 is 51. 51 divided by 12, because this is the grand mean for everybody now, is 5.667. And so now I can get my sums of squares. Because let's refresh our memory of what the equation for sums of squares is. Take each group average, subtract the grand mean, square those values, add them up, and then multiply by baby n as a last step. 
I'll do that. I take 3 and I subtract 5.667. I take 6 and I subtract 5.667. And I take 8 and I subtract 5.667. To get negative 2.667, positive 0.33, positive 2.333. I'm going to square those values now. Right? 2.667 squared is 7.113. Point one one one. Uh, excuse me. Point three 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 squared is point one 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 one. Two point three 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 squared is five point four four three. That is the next step. The next step in my equation, because I've done this right, I've squared them now. And now I have to add them all up. So I do that. Seven point one one three plus point one 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 plus 5.4443, or 5.443, plus is 12.667. And as a final step, I multiply by baby n. So I take that and I multiply by 4 to get 50.668. So my sums of squares between is 50.668. Alright, that is my sums of squares between. But now I need to get my sums of squares error. And let's refresh our memory on what the equation for that is. You take each individual person's score, and we're going to symbolize it with ij, because we're keeping track of individual people, but also the individual group they're in. Because then we subtract the subgroup average from that score. So we're going to take each group's subgroup average and subtract that average from everybody's score. Then we're going to square those values. Then we're going to add them up. That will give us our sums of squares within the error. The error term, right? Because we're getting sums of squares because that's our first step into getting the mean squares, which is our new name for the variances. And so now I'm going to do just that. I've already calculated the subgroup averages. For the first group, it was 3. For the second group, it was 6. For the third group, it was 8, right? And so now I can just subtract all the 3 from everybody in the first group. I subtract 6 from everybody in the second group. And I subtract 8 from everybody in the third group. 1 plus 3 is negative 2. 2 minus 3 is negative 1. 6 minus 3 is 3. 3 minus 3 is 0. And on and on and on and on. My next step is I'm going to square those values. Because again, what is the equation for the sums of squares within? Take everybody's score, subtract their individual subgroup averages. Next step, though, is to square those values. And then I'll add them up. So here's my next step. I'm squaring those values. Negative 2 squared is 4. Negative 1 squared is 1. 3 squared is 9, and on and on, and now I have the squares. My last step is to add them up. Because again, the equation for the sums of squares within is to look within the group and see how each person is different from their own subgroup average. Square those, add those up. Now I have my sums of squares within the group. My sums of squares within the group is 24. Because 4 plus 1 plus 9 plus 4 plus 0 plus 4 plus 1 plus 0, on and on and on is 24. Where did all these numbers come from? Over here. All right, so now what do I need to do? Well, now I need to get my degrees of freedom, right? I have to get the degrees of freedom because that's why I'm going to get my mean squares. So I've got my sums of squares between. I've got my sums of squares within. Now I need the degrees of freedom. How do I get degrees of freedom? Well, for between, it's g minus 1, the number of groups you have minus 1. And for within, it's n minus g, total number of people in your entire study minus the number of groups you have. So here I have degrees of freedom between. I have three groups, minus one, so degrees of freedom between is going to be two. Degrees of freedom within, I take all 12 of my people, because there was four plus four plus four, total of 12 people, and I subtract the number of groups that we have, which was three, and now I have nine. 
So degrees of freedom between is two, degrees of freedom within is nine. So now I can finally get my mean squares, right? Where the mean square between is just gonna be sums of squares between divided by degrees of freedom between. And my mean square within is just gonna be sums of squares within divided by, divided by my degrees of freedom within. So my mean square between is gonna be 50.668 because that was my, where was that? That was because 50.668 was my sums of squares between, right? From this slide here. And so now I'm gonna divide that by two to get my mean square within, excuse me, my mean square between. That's exactly what I'm doing here. Taking that mean square between and dividing it by the, the degrees of freedom between to get my mean square between of 25.334. Then I do the same thing for the within. Recall that my sums of squares within was 24, and now I'm gonna divide that by my degrees of freedom within. And so I take 24 and I divide by nine, because nine was my degrees of freedom within. The total number of people, 12, minus the number of groups I had, three, to get 2.667. And now, let's put all those numbers into my F table. Here was that sums of squares between. Here was that sums of squares within. Divide, here's my degrees of freedom between. Here's my degrees of freedom within. Divide 50.668 by two to get 25.334 for the mean square. Take 24, which was the sums of squares within, divide that by nine to get your mean square within 2.667. This is our effect up here, and this is our error. Effect variance, category-based variance, the amount, the amount of variability in depression because people are in a particular drug group. And here's our error variance, the amount of variation in depression due to other reasons. Divide 25.334 by 2.667 to get 9.499. This, this is our F statistic. So what do we do with this F statistic? Well, we're gonna need to compare this to a critical value. And here is table A3, right? I got my F statistic by taking 25.334 and dividing by 2.667. This was my F statistic. Well, now I'm gonna need my critical F. And here is the F table right here. And what you do is you take the degrees of freedom from the numerator, from the effect, from between, Right, just synonyms for the same idea, and that was two. And that is gonna be along the top. Just like the numerator is the top of the fraction, the numerator degrees of freedom is, runs along the top. So this is gonna be for your, with, for your effect or between. And we had two degrees of freedom between. Then we look for our denominator degrees of freedom, our within or error degrees of freedom, and that was nine. And so now we have to decide. Do you want it, which significance level do you want? Do you want to use an alpha of 0.05? Or do you want to use an alpha of 0.01? Or do you want to use an alpha of 0.1? We're probably going to use 0.05, right? And so our critical value for two and nine degrees of freedom is 4.26. Now notice that what we calculated was bigger than the critical value. So we can reject that null hypothesis like the lemon hypothesis it is. Right, because 9.499 is bigger than this critical value, so we can reject the null hypothesis, which is awesome. That means that among these three drug groups, among the new drugs, Zoloft and placebo, there are differences. At least two of the groups are different from each other. And this one overall, one way ANOVA allowed us to establish that by calculating this F statistic that we're comparing to our critical F. So in terms of decision making, this is exactly like a Z or T. We calculated something, calculating it was more of a pain in the butt, we calculated something and it was bigger than the critical value and so we rejected the null hypothesis and said that our groups are different. Well, at least two of them are different from each other. 
I don't know if they're all different, but among these, this basket of three averages for the new drug, the old drug, and the placebo, there's at least one mean difference here. Two of them are different from each other. One pair is statistically significantly different from each other. So now what? Do we know which groups are different from each other? Is the placebo better than the new drug group? Is the new drug better than the old drug? Is, are they all different? We don't know because the ANOVA, the overall ANOVA, is kind of just like a step one. We do the overall ANOVA to control for inflated type 1 error. That's why we do it. We want one test that allows us in one shot with a true alpha of 0.05, we want one ANOVA, one F statistic with a true alpha of 0.05 to determine if any of the means are different from each other in one shot. But now that we know they are different from each other, well, now we have to actually go and do follow-up t-tests. What? Oh, it's so terrible. Yes, that's right. Um, the, the, getting the overall omnibus ANOVA out of the way doesn't actually relieve us from having to do all of those t-tests that the ANOVA, um, we thought we were doing the ANOVA to avoid. The ANOVA doesn't get, it, get, get us out of work. We're still going to have to do all the t-tests to see which groups are different from each other. But the purpose of the ANOVA is to have like a starting spot. It's a way in one test to determine if any of the means are different. Having a, 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 a true alpha of 0.05 where we do one test. Are any of the groups different? Well, now that we know they are, now we can do some follow-up tests called post hoc comparisons. Post hoc means after the fact because you have to do them after you do the overall ANOVA. Post hoc is Latin and so that's where that comes from. Post hoc means after. So now that you've gotten a calculated F statistic that's bigger than the critical value, now you're going to have to do some follow-up post hoc t-tests. And these are often called multiple comparisons or multiple contrasts. These are just synonyms for the same idea. and you're always going to calculate the t-test in the same way for the follow-up tests, but they but different but there are different philosophies about how to look up a critical value, and so often these post hoc tests are called by different names, and it's not because the t is calculated any different. They're just follow-up t-tests. They're independent samples t-tests that you now have to do once the ANOVA tells you that there are differences. Now you got to go find the differences. But now there's different phil philosophies, and I mean just that. There are different philosophies about what to do about in increased or inflated type 1 error now. And I mean just that. They're philosophies. And these different philosophies are going to dictate different critical values for your follow-up independent samples t-tests. But before we get into philosophy, let's actually see the independent samples t-test equation. Here it is. And this is essentially what we're going to have to do for all of our different comparisons. We have three groups from this example, so we're going to have to do three t-tests. And here is that equation for the independent samples t-test, where we have the mean difference for the first group compared to the mean difference for the second group, and compare that to a null hypothesis mean difference, which is just going to be zero. Divide this mean difference by standard error. But notice that there's no more pooled variance. Instead of calculating pooled variance, what we do is we use the error variance. We use the mean square within as our best estimate of the total amount of variance in the population. This stands in for pooled variance. But if you've already calculated the overall ANOVA, then you, already, you can already plug this in. Super easy. And then you go one over baby N, 1 over baby n, and you calculate the uh, follow-up t-test exactly like you would bef uh, for when we did them for the independent samples t-test. And so let's look at how this applies to our current example. So to go back in time for you, let's go back. Uh, let's do, do, do. Here are the going to be the follow-up t-tests for our current example. Let's go back to our data real briefly. Now remember, 
we had the placebo, uh, not, oh, not, we had, now remember, we had three groups, right? Where the new group, where the new, where the, where the new drug group had an average of three, right? And the Zoloft group had an average of six. And the placebo group had an average of eight. All we're doing now is seeing, are these averages different from each other? We know that at least one of them are going to be different from at least one other. That's what the F test told me. At, it, when we do our follow-up T tests, at least one of those T tests are going to be different. But here are those averages. So now I'm going to plug those averages in to three different T tests. Here's me comparing Zoloft to the new drug. Here's me comparing the placebo with an average of eight to the new drug. And here is me comparing the placebo to Zoloft, right? So here are all of those mean comparisons. And then, of course, here's that null hypothesis mean difference, which is just zero. And what I plug in is baby sample size is four, right, for all of the groups. So I'm going to have one over four, one over four, because there were four people in each group. Then I go to my ANOVA table, and I find my mean square within. There it is, 2.667. And I then plug it in instead of pooled variance. Hooray! I no longer have to calculate pooled variance. I just have to use the mean square within, which is my error variance. And so now these are the three different t-tests. And notice, and we have nine degrees of freedom. Uh, because you use your, for your follow-up t-tests, uh, oftentimes you use um, n minus g degrees of freedom. Um, you use your error degrees of freedom, your within degrees of freedom to look up a critical T. But I'll go over that in a second. So this is how you set up those follow-up T-tests. It's just like an independent samples T-test. The only difference is you use mean square within instead of pooled variance. So why don't I, and notice that the bottom part of the fraction is exactly the same for all three t-tests because you're essentially estimating standard error using all three of your groups because mean square within was calculated for all three of your groups. So it becomes a better estimate of pooled variance than doing a, doing a new one for every single t-test. So you put that error variance in here, and now your estimated standard error is going to be exactly the same for all three of your follow-up tests which is super nice. So let's calculate standard error first, because it's going to be the same for all three tests. We plug in mean square within, 2.667, right? Plug in 1 over 4, right, for, for 1 over baby n. And now I get 2.667 times 2 over 4, which is 2.667 times 0.5, which is 1.334. And as a final step, I get the square root. Right? So my standard error is 1.155. I can then plug that in to my t test equations, where I, the mean difference for the Zoloft group compared to the new drug group, 6 minus 3 is 3, divide that by standard error. So my follow up t statistic is 2.597. Then I do the same thing, except now I'm going to compare the placebo group to the new drug group. And again, zero is just the null hypothesis mean difference. Eight minus three is five. I divide that by standard error, 1.115. Five divided by 1.155 is 4.329. That is my follow-up T statistic for this comparison, comparing the placebo group to the new drug group. But now I'm gonna need to compare the placebo group to the Zoloft group where I go eight minus six is two, and I divide that by standard error to get 1.73. That is my follow-up T statistic for this comparison. And so here is where philosophy comes in. You always calculate the t-tests the same. Your follow-up t-tests are calculated like this, except now in order to know whether or not the Zoloft group is different from the new drug group, or the placebo is different from the new drug group, or the placebo group is different from the Zoloft group, you have to compare these T statistics to a critical value. And you're not gonna compare them to a critical F. That was the critical F from the F test. These are follow-up T tests. So we are gonna need a critical T value. And this is where philosophy comes in. There are different 
they're, qu they're quite literally philosophies about how, whether or not you should correct for inflated type 1 error because you're doing multiple tests. You are doing multiple t-tests. Is inflated type 1 error a problem? And if it is a problem, how big a problem is it? And there really are different schools of thought on this. There's vociferous heated debate among quantitative psychologists about how one should correct for inflated type 1 error. Fisher, so named from the man who derived ANOVA, Fisher, he had a, he, he, when he first derived ANOVA, um, he had a philosophical idea. And so one of the camps is called Fisher's LSD, Fisher's Least Significant Differences. That's what LSD stands for. And it basically says, calculate the follow-up t-test using mean square within instead of pooled variance, right? And look up the critical values using n minus g degrees of freedom, right? Using the error degrees of freedom, the within degrees of freedom. And you're done. And it basically is making, the only corrections it's making is saying that first you calculate the f. If the f says don't, uh, there's no differences here, then don't do the t-test. You're done. But if the f statistic says there are differences, then you just go find them. Fisher, a Fisher's approach and doing Fisher LSD follow-up tests essentially says inflated type 1 error is not a problem now. And so your critical values are going to be exactly the same as they would be if you were just doing a regular t-test, except you're using n minus g degrees of freedom instead of n minus 2. And you're using mean square within instead of pooled variance, right? And so it's a very easy to reject the null. You're not making any correction for the fact that you're doing more than one um, analysis. A very conservative approach, though, is called bone Ferroni. And bone Ferroni says, no, no, no. Inflated type 1 error, it is still totally a problem. It's just as big a problem as it was if you hadn't done the F test. It's all well and good. It's nice that you did the F test, but you still have to change your alpha and make your alpha small, smaller than 0.05, to correct for inflated type 1 error, inflated alpha. Um, and so you basically take your alpha and you divide by the number of tests you're doing, right? If you're doing three, three t-tests, you divide alpha by, by three. It's a very, it's going to make for much, much, much bigger, it's going to make for much bigger critical, critical values. So it's going to be more difficult to reject the null hypothesis in the follow-up t-tests. And, um, and it's, it's not an approach most people take. Uh, because what can happen if you take a bone Ferroni approach is you can have an F test, an F statistic, an overall omnibus ANOVA, you could have the F test tell you there are differences, and then if you do a bone Ferroni correction, none of your T tests could turn out statistically significant. So you'll be like, well, the F set test told me there would be differences, but now I'm not finding them because I made my alpha so super small. So Fisher doesn't correct at all. Bone Ferroni corrects a lot. And then there are different other camps. And there's even more than we're going to go over. Your book talks about one called Chaffe, which I don't cover. Uh, the one I want to share with you is called Tukey's HSD, Tukey's Honestly Significant Difference. And it actually uh, tries to derive the appropriate critical value because that's where these philosophical camps differ. You're going to calculate the, the actual observed, obtained, calculated test statistic the exact same way. It's how you look up the critical value that's going to be different. Fisher says, look it up like you always did. Use alpha of 0.05. Use n minus g degrees of freedom. Use mean square within instead of pooled variance, and you're done. Bone Ferroni says, not so fast. Do that special t-test, but now your alpha needs to be divided by the number of tests you're doing. Very conservative. Where Tukey's tries to find a critical value somewhere in the middle of Fisher's and Bone Ferroni's, right? So it's going to be medium in terms of its ability to reject the null hypothesis. Think of them in terms of power. Fisher's is going to be more is going to be more powerful. Bone Fronies is going to be less powerful, and Tukey's is going to be someplace in the middle. When you think about how this is going to affect our ability to reject the null hypothesis, and so Fisher's LSD essentially doesn't correct at all, right? If you don't reject the null hypothesis in the overall ANOVA, don't do any follow up t tests. 
If you do reject the null hypothesis, then do all of the follow-up t-tests. Conduct two-tailed independent samples t-tests because ANOVA is a non-directional approach. Use n minus g degrees of freedom when you look up the critical values in, the, in table A2. Right? Use the same alpha that you did from the F-test, and we're going to call that the family-wise alpha rate. We're just going to, we're going to use 0.05 for everything. Right? And so we'll use that same alpha of 0.05. Boneferroni, it makes a correction by changing your alpha. You're still going to do the same two-sided independent samples t-test. You're still going to use n minus g degrees of freedom. You're still going to use the same family-wise alpha of 0.05 from the F-test. If you're using an alpha of 0.05, you don't have to, but most people do, right? But now you're going to take that alpha of 0.05 and you're going to divide it by the number of comparisons you're doing, right? And keep in mind, making your alpha smaller is going to make the critical values bigger, which is going to make it harder for you to reject the null hypothesis. So if our omnibus alpha from the overall F-test was 0.05 with three groups, then I would take 0.05, I would divide by three because I'm going to have to do three comparisons. So my new alpha is 0.016 for each of my t-tests in my follow-up family of t-tests. So I'm only going to reject the null if P is less than 0.016. And like I said, this can result in some very strange things where the F-test tells you there are differences and the follow-up T-test tells you there aren't. That's very strange. So I don't really hold with the bone for any correction. I think it's much too conservative and, you, and, it, and it just results in some very strange conclusions. Um, so then there's Tukey's. Tukey's honestly significant difference where it actually derives the correct critical value. Um, and remember back from the central limit theorem, how that was actually a derived relationship about sampling distributions. Well, Tukey's HSD is just that too. It derives a Tukey's HSD set of distributions. We're not actually going to do that in here because your book doesn't cover Tukey's. And um, in order to do a Tukey's honestly significant difference, you would need this thing called the Q-crit table that allows you to look up the appropriate critical value. Um, but you just need to know um, for your information that, that the critical value that you find using a Tukey's is going to be somewhere in between the critical value that you, that you would have in a Fisher's LSD approach where you make no correction and the critical value that you would have in a Bone Ferroni's, which makes a huge correction, makes critical values much bigger. Um, and if you would like to know what philosophical camp I fall into, I actually fall into Fisher's. I don't even think you need to do the correction from a Tukey's. I think that once you do the overall ANOVA, that's your control. You're doing one test with a true alpha of 0.05 that's telling you whether or not there are any differences. The follow-up t-tests are just a fact-finding mission. Now you're, the, the, the ANOVA told you there'd be differences. Now you're going to find them. No correction needed is actually the philosophical camp I fall into. But you should know there are lots of people who disagree with me. Some people are pretty, are make a, there are some researchers that use, use bone for only corrections because they're super scared of type 1 errors. And maybe because in their research, a type 1 error is a really big deal, right? I had an advisor that only used bone for only corrections. Many, many people use a Tukey's HSD correction or a Shafe or some other type of uh, philosophical camp. The bottom line is you calculate the t-test the same way. Where philosophy comes in is where how you look up the critical value. And so let's see how we look up the critical values for a Fisher's LSD or Bone Ferroni example. Now in our example that we calculated, here, we had nine degrees of freedom within. So that's how many degrees of freedom we're gonna use to look up our critical T. So I've got nine degrees of freedom, and here is an alpha of 0.05, which is what I would be using if I'm taking a Fisher's LSD approach. I'm not correcting. The ANOVA told me there'd be differences. I'm just going to find them. So I'm going to use a critical value of 2.262. But if I'm going to take a much more conservative bone Ferroni approach, I'm going to be using an alpha of 0 0.016. 0 0.01 is the closest I can get here. 
And so my critical value, if I'm using a bone Ferroni correction, is 3.25, a much bigger critical value. So it's going to be more difficult for me to reject the null hypothesis. And so let's see what that does for our follow-up t-tests. Now, the critical value for a Fisher's LSD is 2.262. We just looked it up. The critical value for using a bone Ferroni approach is 3.250. And I went ahead and looked up the, the, the critical value for a Tukey's because I have access to Qcrit tables. And it's 2.906. Notice that it's in between Fisher's LSD and bone Ferroni because it tries to find sort of a Goldilocks approach to making corrections. So here are those T statistics again, right? So here I've got 2.597. This was the difference between the Zoloft group and the new drug group. And if I'm using a Fisher's LSD approach, I'm deciding that these groups are different. See how this is bigger than the critical value using a Fisher's LSD approach. I would say these groups are statistically significantly different. Reject the null. It looks as though the new drug with its average of three for depression has is, 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 is better than the old drug because these groups are statistically significantly different. But if I used either a bone Ferroni or a Tukey's correction, I would fail to reject the null hypothesis. So as a researcher, you have to decide whether or not you think a correction is needed. And I think different fields of, of research are going to make a different decision because it's the consequences of a type 1 or type 2 error. Right? They may be very different depending on the discipline. Like, let's say um, the drug is very, very expensive. The new drug is super, super, super expensive, and you don't want to assume it's better unless you're really, 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 really sure. So maybe you would make a bone for any correction because you don't want to make a type 1 error. But let's say committing a type 1 error is less high stakes. Say you're doing more social psychological research where committing a type 1 error would just be hmm, not a big deal because someone is probably going to replicate your study and no lives are on the line, right? Either way, you have to decide. Are you going to take a Fisher's LSD approach or a Bone Ferroni approach? Because those are the only two ways um, that, that your book really covers that I want to cover. I'm not a big fan of Chaffee, so I don't, I don't even cover it. Your book talks about it. So you have to decide as you're doing your lab. Um, are you going to take a Fisher's approach or are you going to take a Bone Ferroni approach? And it's really, are you, going to, are you going to use an alpha 0.05 or an alpha 0.01? It's your choice, right? But either way, so here I've got the comparison of the placebo to the new drug. And my T statistic was 4.329. And no matter what approach I take, I'm going to be rejecting the null hypothesis because this was a fairly big difference here, right? And so I, if I, even if I use a Bone Ferroni approach, I'm still going to reject the null hypothesis. And then here, my T statistic was 1.73. And notice I'm failing to reject the null hypothesis no matter what approach I take. This is, was the placebo group compared to the old drug group. I apparently have research that indicates the old, old drug of Zoloft doesn't do any better than the placebo even. And no matter what philosophical approach I take to the critical values, I'm going to fail to reject the null. Here, I have to decide. Which approach am I going to take? Here, I'm going to reject the null no matter what. And here, I'm failing to reject the null no matter what. So, in summation, the overall omnibus ANOVA, which is calculated when you do the F test to calculate the F statistic, tells us whether or not there are any differences at all among our averages. The follow-up multiple post hoc comparisons tell us where those differences are. And I take, I think the Fisher's LSD approach is just fine. Just go calculate the t-tests and tell me where the differences are. I don't really think any correction is needed at all. But you should know there are some disciplines like medicine where a correction may be important. It's just not the philosophical approach I take. And because we're doing follow-up t-tests, we can calculate confidence intervals for those mean differences too. And so I want to run you through how we do that. And, uh, and so first, keep in mind that whenever you calculate a confidence interval, um, what you're doing is saying, I want to be this percent sure, confident, that the real mean or the real mean difference is somewhere in here. 
right? That's the whole idea behind a confidence interval, estimating the actual parameter that you care about. And in this case, we have three different mean differences from these three different follow-up tests where we might want to calculate a confidence interval where we could say, I'm very confident that the real mean difference is somewhere in here. And remember that in a confidence interval, you're going to need standard error. But happily, we already calculated standard error for our follow-up t-test when we did our t-test. Hooray! So now we can use that standard error in confidence intervals. So let's look at it. Here we have those mean differences. The first mean for the first group was 3. The second mean for the second group was 6. And the third mean for the third group was 8. And I had four people in each group. Now remember, to get a confidence interval, you take the descriptive statistic, which in this case is the mean differences. Then you're going to add and subtract that to the product of the critical value times the standard error. And this is now, so philosophy has to come in. If you did a bone Ferroni correction for the t-test, you're going to need to do a bone Ferroni correction to look up the critical value for the confidence intervals as well. I'm going to take a Fisher's LSD approach and use the, um, and use the critical values from the Fisher's LSD. And so that's exactly what I've done here. Here's that mean difference for the, so this is the Zoloft group compared to the new drug group, three. So I'm going to center my confidence interval around three. I take the critical value from the t-test, 2.262, and I multiply that by standard error, which again, is just the bottom part of the fraction from the t-test. Then I take 2.262 and I multiply that by 1.155, critical value times standard error. Then I'm going to both add and subtract that from three. So I can be 95% confident that the real difference between people who take the Zoloft and people who take the new drug is somewhere between 0.387 and 5.613. So not zero, right? They're, they're, the difference between them is not zero because zero is not within this interval because my descriptive statistic is the mean difference here and the null value in an independent samples t-test is zero. And then I do the same thing when I compare the placebo of 8 to the new drug, right? I, I multiply 2.262 by 1.155, and I've already done that, and that's 2.613. I both add and subtract that from 5. So I can be 95% confident that the real difference in depression between people who take the placebo and people who take the new drug is somewhere between 2.387 and 7.613. So not zero. And remember, I took the I took the Fisher's LSD approach to look up this critical value of 2.262. Now by now I'm going to compare my Zoloft old drug group to my placebo group, six to eight. And I get a mean difference of two. I'm going to add and subtract 2.613 because that's these two numbers multiplied together, I'm going to add and subtract that from 2. And so I can be 95% confident the real difference between the old drug group of Zoloft and placebo is somewhere between negative 0.1613 and positive 4.1613. So could be 0, because 0 is within that interval. And the only thing that would change for these follow-up confidence intervals if I did a bone Ferroni approach, is I would need to plug in the critical value of 3.250 into these equations instead of 2.262. And then I will be taking a bone Ferroni approach to the follow up t tests. All right, last thing. We now we can calculate an overall ANOVA, we can do the follow up t tests. We can do confidence intervals around those follow-up independent samples t-tests. But now we also need an effect size. And we need an effect size for the overall ANOVA. And you can calculate Cohen's D's for your t-tests too. right? You can absolutely calculate Cohen's D for the follow-up t-tests. We're not going to go over that in here, but you can, because we've already covered Cohen's D a lot. Um, and you should know that you can. Um, if you're interested on uh, the, the minor tweaks that you need to do um, to Cohen's D to do an ANOVA, um, you're more than welcome to chat with me. But most of the time, when people do an ANOVA, they don't report the Cohen's D for the follow-up t-test. Rather, they report what's called a, a standardized effect size for the overall ANOVA itself, where it answers this question. 
how much of the variance in my qua quantitative dimension-based variable can I attribute to group category? So to use my example that we've been working through for this whole, uh, to use the example we've been working on for this whole lecture, it would be, I need something that tells me how much variability in depression is due to the different drugs people took. How much of someone's depression is due to the fact that some people took Zoloft, some people took a new drug, and some people took placebo. It's called variance accounted for. How much variance is accounted for by group membership? How much of the variability in depression is due to the fact that people were shoved into three different groups with three different experiences in terms of the drugs that they took for their depression? And it's basically saying how much do people vary because they were in different groups? How much do people vary on that quantitative variable? And it's super easy to calculate. It's called eta squared for an overall ANOVA. This is not the letter N. It's the uh, lowercase Greek letter eta, um, E-T-A. It's called eta squared. And it's really easy. You simply take the sums of squares between and you divide it by the sums of squares total. Because what you're essentially saying is how much of the variability sums of squares between the groups, right, how much of the total sums of squares is because of the between? How much of the total is because of the category variance? And that gives you your standardized effect. And so let's do that for this example. Let's go back to our source table and find our sums of squares between and our sums of squares and, our sum, and, and actually figure out what our sums of squares total is because now we're going to need it. And to find sums of squares total, all we have to do is add together sums of squares between and sums of squares within. Hooray! And then I get 74.668, right? Now I also, and so why don't we also fill in our total degrees of freedom? It's 11, because 2 plus 9 is 11. And so now we have our sums of squares between which is 50.668, our sums of squares total, which is 74.68. And now I can divide to get my eta squared. And voila, that's exactly what I've done here. I've taken the sums of squares between, and I've divided it by the sums of squares total to get an eta squared of 0.679. This would mean that approximately 67.9% of people's depression almost uh, two-thirds, right? That 60, around 68% of people's depression is because of the, amount, the drug that they took. This would be an enormous effect in real life, right? I made up this data, right? So I, because I, I, I was looking for big effects. Um, in the real world, um, anything above, uh, po uh, anything above um, 0.1, so 10% of the variance uh, is considered a fairly large effect, right? Um, if you can find that a, a, a category-based difference is accounting for 10% of the variability in some quantitative variable, uh, that's a pretty darn big effect. Pretty huge, actually. So, of course, I've manipulated the data here to make a big example, um, but that's what that would mean. About 68% of the variance is due to group category. That about 68% of somebody's depression is because of the drug that they took. 68% of the quantitative variable of depression is because of the group-based category variable of which drug did you take. All right, that's ANOVA. Um, you do have a lab that's due on ANOVA, so make sure you do it. Uh, this last push of the semester, we have two labs before our final, so make sure you practice ANOVA, because I assume ANOVA will be on your final exam. Um, and let me know if you have any questions um, about any aspect of ANOVA, uh, from calculating it by hand, to how to do the follow-up tests, um, to how to fill out the source table. Because that source table is super important. I prophecy it's going to be important in your future. All right, see you next time.